Okay, the lifting body program was, was started by NASA relatives. They wanted to put airplanes into space. And so the two basic configurations were developed, one at Langley and one at Ames. NASA put out a contract then for general contractors to build them out of metal. There had already been one built out of with a basically plywood and, and fabric. Bill Thompson had already flown a vehicle, an M2F2, which had been made out of plywood and had been towed by a car and then released and then he just glided on to see if it could actually be flown. But about this time then NASA put out a contract and or a proposal out to 11 contractors to build the airplanes out of metal. And during the development of the interviews, I think we ended up last. And one of the comments I made on a thing was that I thought that the weight estimate they had put down on it was absolutely stupid and that it really was going to weigh a lot more than that. And I thought our weight estimate was much more accurate than what theirs was. And I think that's why we won the contract, because everybody else all said they could meet the weight, and NASA agreed it was impossible. They just put it in to see what the bait would be. Anyway, we got the contract to build these vehicles, and they got an from uh, I was told to run the, basically put together the design of them. And I was told I could have anybody in the engineering department I wanted. So I was going to end up running all the design, and another engineer named John Wolf was going to do the structures. So we chose 30 people, and I think we had taken all the brains out of the engineering department. These were engineers that could do really understood the task, and they could work fast, so the program would go a lot better. And along with this time, then NASA then decided they were going to participate in the program, and their engineers were involved with us. And it was really an unusual contract from the standpoint the way they participated, because it made everybody, everybody on both sides truly understood what the other was doing. So as a result, we built the vehicle quite rapidly. <clears throat> then they were sent to Edwards for flight test. Edwards being the NASA facility then had all the flight facilities. And they had set up a system where the airplanes could be tracked by a radar, and a radar then would track then a TV camera, so that in the control room we could see the entire flight of the airplane. And during this period then I got involved with a, reviewing all the instrumentation and flight test data that was being come through on their TV screens. And uh, so, supposed to then alert then a fellow named Jerry Gentry, an Air Force pilot, then who was the only one that communicated with the actual pilot flying the vehicles. So as we're progressing along, and I think it was about the 16th flight, that Bruce Peterson is turned to fly the M2F2. He had just carried the loft on a on a pylon on a B-52 that had been modified from what had been used for the X-15 launches. So he was released at about 45,000 feet and had to fly a precise flight pattern to get back down to the ground. As he got approached close to the ground, we think he ran into a wind shear and being that the M2F2 was very roll sensitive, it rolled very violently in one direction and he had, without thinking, put in the opposite input and ended up three rolls before he took his feet off the pedals, hands off the stick, and the airplane straightened out and flew fine, but on a different heading. It was heading toward, a, generally heading toward a medical helicopter. And they kept saying that the chopper's going to get me, and a chase plane, and Gentry kept telling him, no way, just be calm, keep going. So as he approached the ground very close, Gentry told him to lower the gear, and the chase pilot, Bill Dana, who was flying an F-104, and Bruce acknowledged it, but did not release the gear. 
it, as he touched the ground with the tail end of the airplane, he felt he was in ground effect and he released the gear then. And the nose gear was designed to go, go down and lock in one half second. The main gear, one second. The airplane hit on its nose with the nose gear down so it prevented from tumbling end over end, but it immediately skewed sideways and started to roll. And there's questions about how many times it rolled. It rolled fast enough that it stood up its nose boom and rolled back, fell back down and rolled a couple, three turns back over the path that it had originally gone through. While we were in the control room, Gentry then looked at me and he says, what are we doing here? And I says, I don't know, let's go. So we took off out of the building and ran into a NASA car that had a, some ignition keys in it. And we took off for, I think it was about seven or eight miles in to where the crash was. And as we were going out there, I kept telling I kept asking, uh, move it. And he says, I'm already indicating 100 and it won't go any faster. And just all of a sudden, the thing came up on us so fast. It was amazing. First it was far away and it was right at us. So I slammed on the brakes and while the car was still sliding, we jumped out. I don't know what speed we jumped out at, but it was moving pretty good clip. And we ran over to the airplane and the doctors had already landed in their helicopter and gotten Bruce out of the airplane. So I crawled, it was upside down. So I crawled underneath the airplane and turned off all the switches so that nothing was alive in it. And uh, they were putting Bruce onto the stretcher and his whole side of his face looked like a flat plane of blood. And he just kept, the doctor wanted to give him a tracheotomy and Bruce kept saying no, no, no and screaming at him. So finally the doctor felt that if he could talk that well, he didn't need a tracheotomy. So finally they put him on, tried to put him on a stretcher and let him lie down and he wouldn't, he braced himself. So they finally had to take off and take him to a UCLA medical hospital sitting up in a, on a stretcher. Later on we looked at all the data on the thing and figured out that uh, he had probably been so violently, so violently shaken up by the severe oscillations, which I don't remember what they were, but they must have been 100, 200 degrees a second. So anyway, they took him to the hospital and as a result of his uh, face hitting the ground, he had scraped off his eyelid and a lot of his cheekbone and face, facial tissue. After Bruce was taken away, we looked at the wreck and I decided that it was a good design because the center structure we built was a real rigid box and then all the outside curvature to meet the flight contour, the contours of the vehicle were just sheet metal added on the outside. So as a result, we thought we could rebuild the thing. We didn't have to start from scratch to build a new one. And we finally got a contract then to rebuild the thing. And knowing that we only had a very few, I only had a very few engineers, I don't remember how many, four or five, something like that, to rebuild it. But I also knew that to do it, we really had to control the cost because we bid such a low amount of money. So I came, out of, I came up with a modified PERT program that Admiral Rickover had put together for the Poseidon nuclear submarine. It, this is a system by where you kept track of every every part from the beginning to the installation in the vehicle. So with that and with having a 
former head of advanced design or advanced manufacturing who are going to build it, participate in all the building of, of it in the manufacturing and keep track of what they're doing. And one other person who kept track of the parts as they came off from one machine to another. So we knew exactly what was going on, plus we kept track of all the minutes that each manufacturing <coughs> task took, so we knew how much money was being spent on it to the dollars. So every week then I'd have a, have a girl summarize all the dollar expenses, and with the charts that we kept up on, we knew exactly where we were. As a result, I think I knew it was 50 cents to to the pen, to the fifty cents, how much money we had already spent. We finally got the thing rebuilt, and they put a rocket engine in at that time, along with HL10, and they continued the flight tests on the vehicles. I forget how many more flights on the two of them, but quite a few of them with rocket engines. And then <clears throat> when they released in the B-52 at forty-five thousand feet. They ignited the rocket engines and climbed to about 90,000 and then glided back down. So they got a lot of flight test data. In order to train the pilots to do this type of thing, they took a F-104 and made it dirty, putting down flaps, landing gear, everything they could put out into the airstream. So that cell over D was about three or four, which is about what the M-2 was. I think the HL-10 is around four or five. And that way it glided like a brick. <clears throat> and they touched down at around from 160 to 270 miles an hour. And, but everything worked fine from there on. We had no problem whatsoever. NASA flew several more flights on both HL-10 and, and M2F-3. One thing I forgot to mention that in modifying the M2F-2 to the M2F-3 is that we put a center fin in it in a, in order to stabilize and roll a lot better. And we also beefed up the front end of the airplane so if it ever stood on his nose boom again, the nose boom would not go through the, the guy's belly. And uh, the airplane weighed more, but it's better balanced and much more stable. The whole program was pretty much ended from the standpoint that NASA had gathered enough data to prove that you can come from space and a very low L over D vehicles and land them properly and safely. Eventually, I guess it just progressed into the space shuttle, which I had nothing to do with.